Good evening to you, aviation enthusiasts. I am Jamie Beckett, AOPA Foundation's You Can Fly Ambassador in Florida, joined by my good buddy Pat Brown, who is AOPA Foundation's You Can Fly Ambassador in Texas for the, the central United States, and Kay Sunrum, holding down the left coast from her position in San Diego just beautifully. Tonight, we're here to talk to you about air traffic control and all the wondrous things that pertain to air traffic control. Let me read you some stats because they really are fairly astounding. There are 14,000 individuals working in as many as 700 facilities serving approximately, get this, 70,000 flights a day. They cover 5.3 million square miles of United States airspace. And at any given moment, at any time, at this time right now, there's about 5,000 airplanes in the air being controlled by ATC. That's just remarkable. So if anybody, uh, let's make this simple, y'all. If you've ever spoken to ATC, go ahead and put a thumbs up in the in the chat. If, you, if you've just pressed the button and say, howdy, that's good enough. Give me a thumbs up in the chat that you have spoken to ATC. Of course, you know our standard policy. We're talking about air traffic control. You can ask us about anything you want because we're that kind of compassionate people. Um, I, I don't even know where to start, Kay. I, I guess with tower controllers, that's what most of us deal with. And, and Martin Kastenbaum has spoken to ATC. Costas Otakis has talked to ATC. Wormy. You know, that's a bold move, going with Wormy on, the, on social media. So what do you think, Kay? Um, is a control tower in Southern California, really dense, populated airspace, is that the same as a tower in Wyoming, do you suppose? In terms of the operations, yes. But in terms of maybe your uh, experience, it'll be very different if you're in a very busy, busy airspace. And so the best thing to do is know what the local procedures are like and follow the pilot controller glossary in terms of what to say, how to say it, when to say it, and, uh, and then just practice. Yeah, you know, Pat, I was flying into Sun and Fun with one of our coworkers once in the AOPA Super Cub, if you remember that, it had floats and amphibious floats and skis. And we called into Lakeland Tower like 12 miles out. And Tower came back and said, give me a call at four miles. And I asked our coworker, who was a private pilot and did a great job flying the plane. But I said, do you know why they want us to call it four miles out? And he said, no. And I said, that's where his airspace begins. That might be one of the great misunderstandings, isn't it? That the Tower controller doesn't control your movements for your entire flight. It's just around that airport traffic area, really, isn't it? Yeah, and it's uh, and, and, and that four miles on class Delta airspace, um, it's interesting. I, there, there's a misconception that somewhere in the regulations it defines class Delta airspace as four nautical miles a radius, and it doesn't. Um, there's mm -hmm. nothing in the regs that actually specifically addresses class Delta. It does say that if you have a tower in class golf airspace, you're supposed to contact it within, within four nautical miles. And, there, and, and, and towered airports are, are exceedingly rare in class golf airspace, but they do exist. And so that's kind of where that four nautical miles comes from. But it's, it's, not, it's, not, in, it's not codified in, in, in the regs in any, anywhere. Yeah, that dimensional thing is interesting because we learn fairly early on, maybe from the pilot's handbook of aeronautical knowledge, the dimensions, but the reality is, and we cover this in Rusty Pilot, the the height restriction on them is all over the place. I mean, the typical is supposed to be 2,500 feet, but of course, it, it could be anything. And, and ahead, here, here's you know here's an interesting thing, too. Just just the and and <laughs> don't take don't. I'm not saying you should do this, but um, it's interesting to note that that there are a couple of airports around here in the Houston area that have vertical limits on the class Delta ring that we see around there. But I know because of talking to the controllers, because I know a bunch of those controllers in these towers, that through letters of authorization or letters of agreement with Houston Center, Houston Center actually controls a fair amount of that airspace in between a particular altitude and whatever is actually charted 
on the chart on, on the chart. So that's really interesting. So you could be calling um, XYZ Airport. I won't name them specific. If you be calling XYZ Airport, say you want transition through their airspace, they'll give it to you, but they don't really have authority over that airspace, even though it's charted. It's very strange. <laughs> that is unique. By the way, Chris Murphy says K's on the best coast. This is very heartful to me, Chris, being on the opposite side of the continent. But I'm going to go with you because I've been to San Diego and it's pretty darn nice. I agree Kelsey, with you, Chris. He's, I'm sorry, Kay? I agree with Chris. <laughs> uh, Costas says he's flying out of KWHP with Burbank, Van Nuys, and LAX in his backyard. That That's kind of busy airspace, isn't it, Kay? There's probably somebody you have to talk to when you're in that area. Costas, I know that area very well, and that is a great place to to learn to fly because when you are surrounded with those kind of airports, with the busyness at all of those areas, uh, then you're really equipped to fly anywhere in the country. So I bet you. that's true. And we've got Eric Pittman, who has been here before. Eric, greetings. It's nice to see you again. He says everyone, so I assume he's talking to Kay and Pat too, but I'm going to take the call because, you know, <laughs> it's Eric. Michael Rogers says he learned to fly in Los Angeles Basin and is based at Van Nuys, best training area hands down. I will tell you, I envy you the lack of humidity because there are days where I really don't like sitting on the ground. But, um, yeah, pretty great place. Alex Rizzo, hello, everybody. Hello, Alex. Don Jones likes the topic. Pat, Kay, I, I believe this topic was Kay's suggestion, but I can't remember for sure because I'm elderly. But um, I agree, it is a good topic. And uh, Kay, we were talking about this earlier. I don't think, you know, there's no rule that a controller be a pilot. And certainly there's no rule that a pilot be a controller. So we're all involved in safety of flight, but looking at it from different perspectives, and you made an interesting point that I probably hadn't thought of consciously. Most pilots have never been up in a tower. Correct. Yeah, I, I encourage pilots to go visit their local air traffic control tower or better yet, the, um, the Terminal Radar Approach Control Facility or TRACON that's near your area. We call them approach control or a, a center, um, air route traffic control center, because it gives you a lot of insight to what they do behind the scenes. And they got a lot of stuff going on in the background and you'll get to understand better what equipment they have and also what their own experience is. And when you do go and check out their environment, I promise you, you're going to come back flying and and you you may not say certain things that you used to before uh, because you recognize that you're not always dealing with other pilots. So if you say uh, partial panel, they might not know what that means, uh, depending mm. on you know who the controller is. If they're a pilot, obviously they will. So just checking out the facility, it, it gives you a great idea of. Uh, what their capabilities are. And, and the reason I highly encourage that is that in the event of an emergency, you're more likely to use their services if you really know what they're equipped with. Yeah, and you bring up an interesting point. I was going to discuss this later, but since you touched on the topic of how we say things, partial panel being a great example, if you're not a pilot, you don't know what that means, where the pilot is trying to say, I'm in an emergency situation, but the controller doesn't necessarily understand that. Pat and I both fly out of non-towered airports, class golf, where we are our own controllers. We're supposed to self-announce. But, you know, whether it's at the tower or the air traffic control center, air radar, blah, 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 you know what I'm saying, the ARTCC, or the center, we always call with our end number. And yet when people get into golf airspace, for some reason, they start saying Silver Cirrus, White Cessna, Yellow Piper, like they're the only Silver Cirrus, White Cir Cessna, or Yellow Piper in the world. That's really not the right way to do this, is it, Pat? I mean, the aim really does tell us you're supposed to use your end number, and you really should act in non-towered airspace the same way you act in towered airspace. Do you agree with that? Well... Yes, yes, and no, and, and let me see if I can explain it. I, I, I'm I, I struggle with this one, Jamie, because I know you feel really, really strongly about this, and I, and I struggle with this a bit. Um, when you have three or four airplanes in the traffic pattern, and and they're just saying this is uh, four two Victor uh, left downwind. This is uh, 
you know, 103 uniform Charlie turning crosswind. Um, I, you know, I, I don't, I, sometimes it's hard to, I mean, well, how fast are they? Uh, you know, what, 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 and, and if they don't say Cirrus 1 2 November, or if they don't say Sky Lane and, and they just say Cessna 1 2 November, or if they say Piper, I mean, how do I know they're not a Malibu? which is 180 knot airplane or well or yeah i was not specific and you're exactly right you should say the make the model the end number so cessna cardinal one two three four five piper saratoga one two three four five that's true because now you have a sense of their performance yeah and so you know if if people are making those kinds of radio calls then i think the tail number is absolutely the appropriate thing to do i certainly don't want to to challenge you know things that are in the aim because they're there for a reason and generally speaking i think they're they're really good suggestions for us to 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 live by and i mean by living i mean not get killed uh, so um so yeah so in in that broader sense i agree with you jamie uh, if they're if they're just saying white cessna left downwind or something like that um that doesn't really tell me much more than just the N number. If it was, if it's twin Cessna, right? Uh, that's a little bit more information. But is it a twin Cessna three ten, or is it a four twenty one Golden Eagle, or is yeah. it a twist? Yeah, I I always default to well. First of all, it's written down in the aim what they want us to do. It's not that complicated. When when the rule is written down, just do that. But when people start identifying themselves by color alone, it, I find it challenging because first of all depending on where the sun is and are you two miles away from them it can be very hard is that the white cesto they're talking about because it looks red because there's a red stripe and, you know whereas if you use your end number i can keep track of that because it doesn't matter then if there's one person talking or two people talking as you know cfi and student two different voices saying white cesta is that two different white cestas or the same white cesta yeah. Well, Jamie, I wanted to also know when you say the end number, you don't have to at a, a non-tower field, you don't have to say your full call sign. You can just say the last three, because a lot of people will not remember the, you know, all all the characters, but they are more likely to remember the last three. Yeah, and of course, the primary reason you use the full end number when you're talking to ATC is you don't know if using. November one, two, three, four, five. You don't know if they're also talking in November two, one, three, four, five. So you can't just abbreviate it. But if you're in a non-towered situation, yeah, it's it's usually not an issue. By the way, Eric Tandy has a great question here that I gotta admit, it took me a couple of years to figure this one out. What's the difference between departure and approach? Are these names interchangeable for the same organization? You wanna take that, Pat? Sure. It's the same guy or gal watching the same screen on the same frequency. And uh, it, it's, you know, if you really want to parse it down, when you're coming into Houston, you're going to say Houston approach. If you're, if you're leaving the Houston airspace, you're going to say Houston departure. It doesn't matter. Uh, it, it really doesn't matter. Most of the time out of habit, to be quite honest with you, uh, when, I'm, uh, when I'm departing the Houston uh, area and I check in with them. It's Houston Approach, uh, Skyline six five six nine. Mike just off West Houston, and uh, that's just a habit. And it's the same same person, same screen, same seat. You know, it's it same thing. Yeah, it took me a while to figure that out, and I got to admit, when I realized Orlando Approach and Orlando Departure are the same frequency and it's the same voice, I aha, <laughs> I got it. <laughs> By the way, Kelly Shartner asks, and I don't know the answer to this, what kind of college degree do you need to be an air traffic controller? My 14-year-old son is very interested. Either of you have insight on that, what the degree requirements are? You know, I, I don't. I, it certainly would be easy enough to find out. Uh, you know, college restrictions or requirements um, in, in the era of the shortages that we're experiencing, both pilot and ATC shortages. Uh, I mean, um, I, there's a, uh, estimates of of, of, um, uh, of of the shortages are, are staggering in, in coming years. And you know, used to used to have a, used to have to a, a, used. To, Jamie, I'm suffering. 
from the from the Beckett. I understand. I, you're supposed to start drinking after the show, Pat. Uh, well, I, and I don't have the glass anyway. Uh, um, uh, you you used to have have to have a college degree or at least military experience to be an airline pilot. Yeah. And until recently, you used to have to have a college degree to be an airline pilot. And that stuff is dropping by the wayside. Of course, you don't need a, any college to be a, a mechanic. Um, and uh, so I would suggest to I don't I don't I can't see on my screen here who asked the question. But I would suggest that she uh, contact the FAA, um, call, call one of the local uh, uh, towers and just ask the question. Yeah. You can also literally Google how to become an air traffic controller. But Donnie, our, our producer, Donnie McKay, who is the real brains behind this outfit, he was nice enough to pop up on the screen the phone number for the Pilot Information Center. Now, that's open to AOPA members, but I have a feeling, Kelly, if you were to call up and say, hey, Jamie and Pat and Kay told me to call you. My son wants to be an air traffic controller. How do I get him started on that? They will tell you in the phone number and the email address is right there on your screen. Feel free to get a screen capture of that or just jot it down if you're one of those people that carries a pen with you everywhere you go. And... Uh, Give them a call. Seriously, it, the, Pat's not kidding. There is a huge shortage. Um, many of the educational requirements have been dropped. Not the training requirements. That stays the same. But the, the prerequisite to get involved is not. You know, there's, 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 there, there, there are – I'm sorry, Jamie, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I would never introduce interrupt you, Pat. You are too wise for that. And, there, and, and you know, the FAA is not your only, um, your only uh, avenue – uh, particularly for towers, um, there are companies out there and colleges that train air traffic controllers in the private sector and then deploy them to privately run towers. These are contract towers mm -hmm. uh, and they're paid by the airport or the municipality or wh whoever the case may be, but they're not paid for, not paid by the FAA. So they're not FAA employees. And you can have uh, quite a quite a good career uh, in a contract tower working for a private company, the Sugarland Airport is uh, is a contract tower, and they've had the same crew there for years. They do a great job. Um, Houston Executive Airport is a contract tower. Um, they use a different uh, training facility. There, uh, there's one in Atlanta, I think, and and and, and the, the one from uh, Sugarland is, I think, is up in Minnesota somewhere. I don't don't quote me on those specific locations, but that's geographically a different places. So it's not just the FAA route, although if you're going to be a, I, I don't know if you have to go through FAA uh, training uh, given by the FAA in order to be a, 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 a center controller or, a, uh, or an a, a approach control controller. I don't, I, don't, I don't know that. Um, yeah, we have one, that right here, Bartow, Florida, not far away. It's a non-federally controlled tower. It's pay, they're paid by the city. And but yeah, Kelly, there there's options out there for you. So, congratulations to your son if he wants to do that, he can. Kay, I'm coming to you with Vic. Um, on the topic of visiting a track on or a tower, is there a protocol to follow? Kay, if you wanted to get somebody a tour of a tower, what would be your advice? So, reach out to the airport association that's you know closest to to where you are. And they will most likely have something in place because they'll have a relationship with the control tower. And a lot of the uh, control towers around here also have, um, it's, it's not a, a letter of understanding or anything like that, but it's just a, an informal uh, process with the trade organizations. So uh, flying clubs and flight schools and EAA, the 99s, a uh, bunch of different organizations they do offer the tours, so I would get in touch with one of uh, those resources, and then you can also contact the FISTO too, and and find out if they are offering anything. I know that the Wings program, at least out here, they do once in a while have uh, tours of the Tracon Terminal Radar Approach Control for in San Diego, and I will tell you that if you see something in Wings uh, from, through the FAA safety team. For a tour, you better sign up within the hour because every single one that I've seen just gets it's full because it's a you know, capacity issue. And this is going out to all the people who are registered uh, on the FAA mm -hmm. website. 
And that's so great. if you get that, uh, sign up right away. But that's really the best way to do it. Really yeah, and I'll tell you, I'm, I'm actually flown into a tower field that's not real busy, and the FBO is right next to the tower. And I've just called up and said, hey, you got time for somebody to come up and visit? And if they do, they'll tell you. <laughs> they'll come down and unlock the door. It's, it's not... I mean, it is a high security place. It's not easy to get in, but they're not standoffish. They actually like sharing the view of what they do and how it works. You could also just go to a local flight school. Even if you are a pilot, go to the flight school and say, hey, I'd, I'd really love to get a tour of the tower. Do you guys have a connection there? They very well may, and just give them a call. By the way, Wormy, I'm sorry, Pat, go ahead. I was saying there's some benefits to getting, getting into the tower operators, too, because the, uh, you know, where I'm based at West Houston Airport, in order to get down to one of my favorite lunch places, I have to fly through Sugarlands airspace. And so it's gotten to the point when I call up, usually um, uh, when I do, there's a particular controller on duty. And, uh, and I met him a few times, but uh, when I call him up and I, and I tell him, uh, I give him my tail number and I stop and he'll usually say transition approved, enjoy lunch and I'll see you on the way back. So, so. I have experienced that with you. We've made that flight and, <laughs> and that's the actual call we get back. <laughs> hey, Wormy is back saying he's interested in ATC. And I'm sorry, Wormy, I'm assuming you're a he. If I'm wrong, I very much apologize. Considering ATC is a career, what's the next 10 years look like? And I think... Okay, I'll come to you on this. In all honesty, I don't think it matters if you want to be a pilot, a mechanic, an administrator, a dispatcher, an ATC person. The field is wide open, and they are really working hard to, to recruit people. Is that your experience as well? I would agree with that. There's a lot of opportunities in, in all those different venues. Uh, just go out and look at the requirements on the website. And, uh, you know, if it's a pilot, always for the for the uh, the FAA, if it's for air traffic control, another resource and we didn't mention this earlier is NATCA. That's National Air Traffic Controllers Association. They have a lot of good information on their website. And so go out and take a look and, and find out what the requirements are. But there's a lot of opportunities in all those areas because there are shortages. Yeah, true, true. And by the way, we're getting great comments from viewers tonight. Thank you very much for doing that. I'm, I'm going to keep going with these because they're fantastic. Don Jones says he's out of Stinson Field, and the tower manager always has been eager to have tours, especially if you bring food. Great people. And I got to admit, I have never had a bad experience going up into a tower. They have always been very accommodating, very welcoming. Sometimes they ask to have their picture taken with me, which I find curious because I've seen me. I wouldn't want a picture with me at my house, and I, think, I am me. I, I think the reason for that, J Jamie, is that if, if they go missing at some point in the future, there's evidence. Uh, <laughs> just, and by the way, SSF is Stinson Field, as he mentioned. Uh, it's a historic uh, airport in San Antonio. Uh, if you just Google uh, the, uh, the, uh, the family around that field, has, has got quite a, a rich aviation history. And Morris Martin is the airport manager, great guy. Uh, they just built a new control tower. I'm, I'm guessing about three years ago or so. It's, 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 it's a great airport. I was just there a couple of weeks ago. Great airport. This is why you should watch Ask an Ambassador every time. The depth of knowledge right here. You know, people tease Pat about reading the FARs, but look at that. He just, oh yeah, you mentioned this field. I know the manager's name. So these are smart people. I'm, I'm just the moderator. They're smart people. We, you need this. Hey, Jay Little says, what can you do when ATC has you extended in a traffic pattern to let a jet pass and they divert you to a runway that doesn't work for you? Kay, I'm going to say unable. What's your response? You know, that word unable is something that a pilot absolutely has to feel so comfortable saying. And a lot of student pilots are not because they think if they're given a set of instructions that they must comply and that's not the rule. So if you're uncomfortable with any sort of instruction, then uh, speak up. I mean, that is not only your right, but it's the smart thing to do. So uh, let them know that you're uh, you're unable. You might have to go around. You might have to be resequenced, but that's better than taking a clearance that you're not comfortable with. You know, Pat, this puts me in mind. I believe it was at Houston Hobby. There was a woman flying a Cirrus 
who really got turned all around and, and it just, it was never good. Yeah. And she kept trying to comply and got behind the airplane and it ended up being a fatal. But that would have been a great example of where, you know, you're on your second or third attempt and it's not working out. You just get me out of here and bring me back in. I'm unable to do this. So have you ever experienced that yourself? You know, no, I've, I've really been very lucky in all the years I've been flying. I, I, re I can't remember a time that I felt like I, I was that ATC was putting me in a in an unsafe situation. Um, I, 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 I've been very lucky. I haven't experienced that. And I, I don't know if I don't know if Donnie can possibly find that link to that ASI video about that case that you're uh, that you're referring to. But I'll tell you what, it is a real study in what could go wrong. And all of it did. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, at, you know, at any given time, if if that young lady had said, um, I, I got to get out of here and go, just gone to another airport. I mean, there, there yep. are several airports that are non tower, uh, close to close to hobby that are yep. were equally, equally close to where she was supposed to be. Um, and um, it, it that was just oh, that was a tragic it is, you know, no, I want to add on to that, what you were saying, Pat, because, uh, and thank you, Eric, that is a, a Cirrus uh, 4252 Golf. It was an SR20. And uh, I highly encourage every viewer, I don't care what airplane you fly or where you fly, but to watch that. Uh, it's it's this hazard in, in in the traffic pattern. It's a crisis that's going on in the traffic pattern, and there's a lot of different uh, triggering factors. But if you watch the Air Safety Institute video on that, they will dissect it. They mm -hmm. did a fabulous job on that. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, that was a, a a focal point at a seminar for one of the presentations I did last year, and so. I watched that video, I think, four or five times preparing for the seminar. And what I recognize is that there was everybody was at mistake. It wasn't just the pilot. So please take take some time and and watch that uh, that accident. And I promise you, you will learn um, at least one or two things new. Yeah. And, and Kay, you you made a really good point. And, and Vic comes in with it as well, using the word unable. ATC is an advisory service and they're giving us clearances. But if we can't safely do that or if we feel overloaded or for whatever reason, that's not going to work. You're allowed to tell them you don't have to do what they tell you if it's an unsafe thing or you just don't feel like you can accomplish it in a timely manner. So, yeah, absolutely. Chris Murphy is saying, when will tower facilities reopen? for tours, track hunts. Kay, I'm going to guess that's on a, a, a regional basis, depending on how different areas deal with COVID and whatever. Yeah. Um, I would say just call the facility and ask, wouldn't you? That's right. I love those short answers. That's right. I, I like them every time. <laughs> they are. Every, yeah, right. uh, every facility has different policies also. Even pre-pandemic, uh, there were some facilities that would never allow a tour, period, even yeah. though they were allowed to. So it really depends on, on the facility. Wow, this Rania Goddess has a really interesting question. I, I don't know that I have an answer to this, but I like it. So there's thought went into this. Thanks for having this live session. Out of curiosity, what are your general thoughts on the integration of near-term urban air mobility operations, near-term with an onboard pilot and command? They're talking about vertical takeoff and landing, short haul stuff. I think it's coming, Pat. You live in a very densely populated area there with Houston with two Bravos. Do you see this coming to your area? Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I mean, I don't know, realistically speaking, if if it's going to be a viable um, thing in 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 the immediate future. Um, but I, I think it's coming. I, I, the FAA is uh, they know it's coming um, mm -hmm. and they're 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 trying to figure out how to how to deal with it because you can't just say sorry you can't do this there's too many millions and millions of dollars that are being invested in companies like lyft and 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 others uh, that are yeah, i think joby is on track to be the first certified if i'm yeah. not mistaken there, yeah. there's a bunch of them out there you're right there's a lot of investment yeah so i think ev tall is is coming i think that uh i think that aerial delivery drones uh, well, let me let me just say it because I can't I can't say much about it because I don't know much about it, 
but I do know uh, for sure that aerial delivery drones are coming to Houston. Um, so, you know, okay, this is just supposition on my part, but we, we spoke about this earlier. We have VFR arrival and departure corridors, transition corridors here in Florida. You have them in, in California. I wouldn't be at all surprised if they established basically corridors for these new types of aircraft that at altitude restrictions to travel. You see a lot of those transition areas in your area, don't you? They work well. They do. So, Jamie, you're you're alluding to the uh, the class Bra the Los Angeles uh, class Bravo transition routes, and and so there's very high traffic in in the LA basin, and so they've established uh, five ways to get clear uh, clearance through the LA airspace, and I'm not talking about drones or anything like that, um, or, or delivery packages just for any airplane that's on a VFR you know, flight, uh, but you have to know what those routes are. And they're they're on the back of the LA TAC, the terminal area chart. They tell mm -hmm. you exactly what altitude you need to be at, what direction and uh, who the controlling, you know, facility is, uh, whether it's a tower or, or um, a approach control frequency and, and what you need to do for the transponder. So all the details are there, but you're not gonna be able to digest that up in the air. You need to sit on the ground and know what yeah. those procedures are. And so I can see something similar to that, to have, um, you know, if you wanna call it flyway zones, or I don't know what the terminology is going to be, but uh, I can see that being a viable option. It's gonna be really interesting, however it goes. And I look forward to seeing it, to tell you the truth. Eric Pittman is back, and, and Pat, brace yourself for this. I met Eric Pittman, and he is old. I mean, he's like 32, <laughs> maybe 33. So he says he thought it would be interesting to be an air traffic controller, but as I said, he is ancient. Um, I think he was born in the 90s. It, oh, it's just tragic. I have um, few older than that. Yeah, he didn't realize you can't be over 30. Do I think they'll ever – do we think they'll ever change that limit? You know – in all honesty, in World War II, you had to be a college graduate to be a pilot. Then you had to have some college. Then you had to be reasonably bright. Then you had to be willing to get in an airplane. I mean, I think we're seeing the same thing you mentioned earlier, Pat, that no major airline now requires a four-year degree to, of a pilot. Right. Um, I can't say I know, Eric, but it would seem to me there is a precedent that if the demand gets extreme enough, the limits change. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, in, in retirement age for uh, for air traffic controllers, I think is 56, um, which is yeah, I think it is which is relatively young. Yeah, we're almost that age, Pat, aren't we? Yeah. You're close to 56 now, aren't you? I vaguely remember that year. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, let's see here. Um, there's a lot of comments. I really like this. Uh, da, da, da. Is there a difference between a military air traffic controller and a civilian? Christopher Ritchie says, Kay, I'm going to say it's the outfit, the clothing. <laughs> but uh, what do you think? Is there a difference between military air traffic control and civilian air traffic control? You know, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know what the uh, procedures are to be a military air traffic controller. I do know that there are uh, centers that do control uh military airspace and special use airspace. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty common, um, but I'm not sure what the requirements are to be one over the other. Yeah, Pat, I'm coming to you with this because you're the smart one. Christopher Ritchie says, what happened to some of the towers that were labeled November Foxtrot Charlie Tango, non-federally controlled towers on the sectional? He knows Martha's Vineyard was one of them. Bartow, Florida is one. You want to field this one, young man? Well, I'm not. I'm not sure. I I, I know a, a specific answer to that. Um, it, it it could be, and I'm just speculating here. It could be that the the chart makers finally realized that it doesn't matter whether it's an FAA control tower or non federal uh, control tower because they're all operating by the very same rules. The phraseology is all the same. There's no no difference uh, functionally between the two. Uh, pilots flying uh, into one or another will, would not know the difference if they didn't know the difference. Um, so my, my guess is that probably just out of, out of a desire to maybe clean up the clutter, cluttered look of, of, a, of a sectional chart, 
or, or a whack chart back in the days that they did whack charts that they just got rid of the uh, non-federal control tower thing. I don't know. That makes all the sense in the world to me. And if anybody's ever seen a sectional chart from the 1960s and a sectional chart today, <clears throat> there's a lot more information today. And I think you're right. You know, the only real difference between a non-federally controlled tower and a federally controlled tower is who cuts your paycheck. Kay, I'm coming to you with Justice Oregon's question, and it's a really good one right up our alley. Hello, AOPA team. What's the easiest way to gain a scholarship in the flight school in the U.S.? I'm going to say there's not an easy way, but there's a lot of options. Go to the AOPA website, aopa.org, and then look under uh, the high school program, and you will see a link to the various scholarships. So uh, there's a ton of opportunities for, for people of all ages to get a flight training scholarship. Thank you, Donnie, for putting that link up there. That'll give you a, um, a, a table of the various different scholarships, what the requirements are, what the deadlines are, what the, uh, the funding amount is. And so please mm -hmm. um, go check it out. Uh, a lot of money there. And um, You'll, you'll, you'll get all the information you need from that link. Yeah, and, and there are others. The EAA does scholarships. Um, Women in Aviation International does scholarships. There's a scholarship fund just for my county in Florida. There are a lot of them. So explore them and apply to everyone you think you might qualify for. It's worth it. Fernando is saying greetings from Peru. I believe Fernando has been with us before, and I feel like I should learn to speak Spanish because he's making an effort. Um, Chris Stater, I like this one. Chris, Pat, we're going to talk about this. Hey, he's, he apologizes because he's late to the party. No need to apologize, Chris. You're here. That's what it's all about. In other areas of the world, and this is a big deal. ATC services are pay for use. It's not like the United States. You don't just use them because they're there. You actually have to pay to use them. Chris is asking, do we ever foresee this in the United States? And Pat, I'm going to tee you up here. I say no, and I say no because of the efforts of organizations like AOPA that actively battle against this stuff and beat it back repeatedly. What's your thought? Yeah, I think I think you're right about that. Um, in um, in 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 virtually every federal budget since I think the early '80s, regardless of what party is uh, in power. Uh, there has been some form of user fees um, in play. And thankfully, AOPA has uh, friends in high places uh, in Congress that, uh, you know, through their help and uh, activism, we, we and others uh, like EAA have been able to, to beat that back. The, the most onerous thing that happened and I think it really does highlight the, the value of an AOPA membership is that, I gosh, I guess it's been about four, maybe five years ago now, um, there was a proposal uh, floated by a um, congressman out of uh, Pennsylvania, if I recall right, to privatize ATC. That was basically to give ATC to a private company to operate for I assume for profit and the board of directors, if I remember right, had, would have 13 members, most of them airlines and big airport managers. Um, and, and, uh, um, GA would have, I think only had two, two voices on that 13 person board. So, I mean, this was a big, big deal. And, uh, I can remember, um, um, uh, I, I, I I might have just joined, had joined AOP about that time. I, honestly, I don't recall, but that was a really big, that was scary. I mean, that was the scariest, that uh, the, the most frightened I've been uh, in all the years I've been flying because we've been so successful in beating back uh, the user fees, which would be catastrophic for general aviation. We pay for, we pay for the services that we use in general aviation through our gas taxes. Mm -hmm. User fees are super, superfluous, um, and the, and the privatization thing. Um, I mean, just look at Canada, look at look at general aviation in Europe, in in a broad sense. Look at general aviation in Europe, 
and and I mean it, it's not as healthy as it is here in the United States. It's just not. Boy, you're you're not kidding. I have friends in Europe and and they love aviation, but it's unaffordable for many of them there, and the restrictions are extreme. So this is a great question, and I really do appreciate it, Chris, because this is an ongoing battle, and frankly, it's one of the reasons I belong to an organization like AOPA long before I worked for them. The reason that we as Americans are as free to fly as we are is because of organizations like AOPA and their lobbying efforts, because you get into the political realm, that's the way this works. You've got to go in there and do battle at, at the federal level to keep this available for us. P Pat, I'm going to come back to you because you're the DPE. You're, you're the guy who really knows what he's talking about. John Van Der has a great question. Any chance you can discuss how to handle an aircraft dealing with a full loss of communications while in IMC? He says he understands the procedures as a pilot, but how would a controller handle it? Well, I mean, I'm not an air traffic controller. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I could answer that question. But you know, I would, I, I would, I would certainly, I would, I would try not to panic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and begin to look at my options. Um, if, if there is some place that I know without question is VMC, I'm probably going to head there. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I, when, I, when I'm doing instrument check rides, actually one of the scenarios is, you know, we're taking off out of Houston and it's IMC, uh, solid IMC for our entire trip. And we're in the clouds, and we're about 50 miles from our destination, and we have an, we have a total communications of failure. Um, nav's still working, but comms are gone. What are you mm -hmm. going to do? Well, they go through the Avenue F and the MEA and all that other, which is great. Okay, so then I'll, I'll give them a similar situation. Um, you've just taken off. You've just get gotten into IMC. Um, you you try to contact approach control. Um, you can't get in touch with them. You go back to either the tower or Unicom, whatever airport you're flying out of. You can't get in touch with them. Obviously, you have um, uh, a, a complete communications failure. Uh, just having penetrated IMC with a seven or eight hundred foot ceiling, what are you going to do? Most of them immediately say MEA, a a Avenue F, I mean, all of that kind of stuff, and. Yeah, and I say, so we're going to fly 350 miles through the, some of the busiest airspace in the country without talking to anybody? Really? <laughs> and, I, and, 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 yep. I'm, and I'm very careful, very, very careful to, to tell them that I'm not suggesting that they bust a regulation, that, that they do anything that is improper. But I ask them the question, is this an emergency? You would be surprised at the number of people that say, no, it's not an emergency. What? Yeah, I've never, I've never had it happen in IMC, but I did have a complete electrical failure coming out of Key West many years ago. And it was the sun was setting. And that was my thought. I can fly 150, 200 miles home with no radio, going over a military base or two yeah. at night, or I can just go back and circle the tower and get light gun signals. And I, I look at it as almost a version of get home itis. Just because I filed for that destination doesn't mean I actually have to go to that destination. If I have a significant enough problem, even that I'm uncomfortable, I mean, the engine's going to keep running. I'm just, I don't want to do this, so I don't. And, and I think that's your point, Pat. Just because you you filed IFR to go to this other place and you're in IMC, if you've got enough of a ceiling, get, you know, put in the squawk code and get your butt out of there. Well, yeah, and, and, and Rick Vessels brings up a, a good point. Certainly, yes, there's a squawk code for lost comms. Absolutely, there is. I've used it before when I had trouble raising approach control going into Dallas a long time ago. The tower just wasn't answering me. And I thought, well, maybe my comms are down. Because so I squawked squawk 7600 for a few minutes and kept calling the tower. They finally came to me and it was not not a comms issue. But but uh, but but anyway, you know, the, the point of the, the point is, I guess, to get them to realize, wait a minute, this this is an emergency. 
and what can we do in the event of an airborne emergency? And the answer is basically anything you need to do to get the airplane down safely. And part of the scenario is that it's clear and visibility unlimited 30 miles to the east of the airport. We're going west. And it's 30 miles and, you know, it's clear and visit, clear and visibility unlimited just 30 miles the other way because the front, the front's already passed there. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I, you'd be surprised at the number of people that just don't stop to think, wait a minute, if I know it's clear and visibility unlimited over there, the, the smart thing to do is get the airplane on the ground and call ATC on the ground and let them know I'm, I'm on the ground safe. But I diverted, you know, you can you can uh, you can call on the blind 121.5 if you need to. You can you can continue to broadcast because maybe they can hear you, but you can't hear them. So I mean, there, there's so yeah, there's many. A lot of, there's a lot of things going through your head, but I, yeah. I'm with you. Don't go 300 miles in IMC just because that's what you filed. By the way, one Kate, thing I want to add, Jamie, is that uh, this is one reason why I, I highly recommend the pilot, especially those pilots that are flying around in busy airspace to to carry a handheld. And so uh, around where I am in Southern California, if especially, and I do fly live far a lot, and sometimes there isn't an op, there isn't a VFR close by. And so then I got to continue on and and uh, it, it might be for an hour. And, and if it's through the LA airspace, then, then you block that airspace the whole way until you're out of that area. And so just to avoid that, I carry a handheld with me. So um, think of think of getting one. They have come down in price a lot. You can find some for under two hundred dollars. Yeah, that's great advice. I carry one myself. I believe Pat does as well. And 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 just to show how smart Kay is, Elijah G is here saying, just use the unable call and for wake turbulence. And ATC was great in working around it with him. So Kay. People are applauding you all over the nation because of your greatness. <laughs> and uh, because of that, I'm coming to you with Costas's question. If Costas purchases a non-ADSB equipped airplane and wants to fly into class Delta that's surrounded by Bravo and Charlie in the greater Los Angeles area, this is your hometown, how can that be done? Any advice for Costas? Well, within the, the, the Mode C Veil, which is now the ADSB Veil also, uh, and, and we have two major class Bravo airspaces in Southern California, right, in Los Angeles and in San Diego, you are required to have ADSB. Yeah, and it's the, the price has come way down. There are a number of options. It's not nearly as expensive as it once was. There are exceptions, Costas. If you have a classic that never had an electrical system, a Cub, a Champ, a T-Craft, something like that, there are options, but they come with restrictions. It's not just do whatever you want. So in that case, you would be contacting the controlling agency and letting them know you wanted to make a, a flight from here to there at a certain time and a certain altitude, and they would give you instructions by the phone, and then you'd have to follow those. But frankly, I would... I would install the ADSB. If you're buying an airplane, it's a very small upcharge, and it's absolutely worth having it. By the way, Eric Pittman says he was born in the 80s, Pat. No. The answer is the 80s. Hey, so me, I can't correct it. Let me just add something really quickly. There is a process by, by which you can get a waiver on your ADSB requirement. Um, this is early in the ADSB process when – when they weren't uh, performing exactly quite the way they were supposed to be. And there was a, uh, you know, there were some periodic issues with getting ADSB working on after January, 20, January of 2020, <clears throat> there was a process by which you could go to the FAA and obtain a waiver to fly into airspace that required ADSB. Um, I would imagine that that process is still there. Um, I don't know if they're as quick to, approve it as maybe they were in the past, but I would suggest that if that's an issue for him and it's a temporary issue um, to, to look into that, uh, to that process. Um, thank you very much. And I do appreciate Chris Stater uh, plotting K about the handheld and 7,600 on the, the uh, transponder. Jennifer Johnson, is coming to the aid of Kay saying good advice. And I'm betting she's wearing her AOPA hat right now because Jennifer Johnson is not just a repeat viewer. She's a participant. So 
Jennifer, I hope that hat's keeping your head warm on this chilly <laughs> spring evening. Um, John is, is expanding on his question, Pat, about that lost comms. He's asking, what is what is ATC expecting the pilot to do? And I think you kind of answered that. If if your comms go out and if it's a complete electrical failure and you lose transponder and everything, they realize there's a problem. If you're if it's not and you're squawking seven six hundred, they realize you have an emergency and they're expecting you to do whatever you have to do. Although if I'm not mistaken, if I'm near my destination and I was already cleared in for an approach. I can continue on with that approach, can't I? Sure. Yeah, sure. I would imagine. I would imagine that if AT, huh? Another short answer. Excellent. Well, because you were so slow to say something, I figured. Well, maybe he wants me to expand. Um, Always. Never at a loss for words. I would imagine that ATC um, is going to start clearing airplanes out of your way for miles around. Um, if they don't yeah. have communications with you and they don't know what you're going to do, um, I, I bet they're moving people out of your way. Um, yeah, but- and, and I will say, whatever the issue is that you're having, John, you're not the first person to have that. The yeah. controllers have seen an awful lot. Um, you do what you have to do to keep yourself and your passengers safe, and we'll deal with the paperwork later. That's that's really the crux of it. And I'm sorry to interrupt, Pat. I I. I shame myself in this manner. That's, I, I, I got nothing. <laughs> uh, Costas comes back, by the way, on his ADSB question. It's to fly it into a service station. That being the case, you might get a ferry permit or just contact the controlling agency and let them know you're bringing it into the, to the service station and or repair station would be the proper term to get the radio work done, get the ADSB installed. They will work with you on a one-time basis. You can't do that over and over, but they will work with you one time because they want you to have that. Mm-hmm. Um, Veterans, how hard is it to get a special issuance medical with mental health given the draconian nature of the FAA on the issue? Um, I'm going to say I can't answer that. That's going to be a medical question that requires, uh, you're going to have to talk to a, a medical professional on that. Now, I will say you can call the AOPA Pilot Information Center. There are medical folks on staff. I've used them in the past myself when I've had a question about a prescription medication. You can also go see your AME, but not for your medical. Go make a consult, make an appointment for a consultation and talk to them very openly and honestly about your situation. They'll give you advice. But I'm afraid on a um, on a live feed on Facebook and YouTube and without ever meeting you, there's no way I can give you an an accurate answer to that question. And I am sorry about that. And Jennifer Johnson is wearing her hat so in her honor i will wear it too thank you jennifer johnson and by the way you have way better hair than me um and john venture says thank you kindly you know this is the first time on an asking ambassador we've had so many comments we barely got to the topic and i'm thrilled i think it's just great i do want to touch on one thing though pat sometimes we do rusty pilot seminar webinars together and sometimes we touch on a common pet peeve of ours which is when (laughs) in class golf airspace non-towered airspace around an airport there is a way to use the radio still and i'm gonna go with last call and i'm gonna let you go with any traffic in the area please advise are you okay with that pat i'm okay I'm going to say there is no reason to say last call. Nobody needs to know this. There's no action that needs to be taken. Nobody is ever going to say, oh, darn, that guy's not on the frequency anymore. I really enjoyed talking to him. All you have to do is make that last call, departing runway five to the north. That's pretty much it, and you're good. You de- you take off, you depart. People will figure out it was your last call when they don't hear you anymore. But don't use up the bandwidth for no reason, and saying last call gives nobody any useful information. Now, Pat, I turn it over to you for I'm flying into an airport. It's a non-towered airport. I'm 12 miles away, and I decide I am way too lazy to listen on the frequency. So I'll just flip over, push the button, and say, any traffic in the area, please advise. What's your response to that, Mr. Brown? 
<laughs> don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's a short answer. Don't. No. If, if you look at if you look at AIM, uh, chapter four dot one dot nine, and I think it's I think it's paragraph G or H. It actually calls that frequency out specifically and says, "Don't use that. It's 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 a it's improper and don't use it ever." And that's in AIM. I mean, it actually says it actually says that. And uh, it, 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 if 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 you if you say that and nobody answers, what do you know? Nothing. If you say it and five people trying to be good Samaritans answer, um, you don't. You still don't know anything because that you haven't got any usable information. So your best bet really is just to just to make an announcement that this is uh, you know X Y Z traffic. This is Cessna one two three four five Cessna Skylane one two three four five uh, ten miles to the west inbound landing. Um, if there's somebody in the traffic pattern um, who is uh, 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 t- doing takeoffs and landings or something like that, then uh, one would hope that that would trigger that person to say, okay, well, this is uh, Piper, you know, one, two, three, four, five, uh, left downwind, uh, touch and goes pattern work or something along those lines. Cause you know, he or she doesn't want to, you know, doesn't want to bend metal with you. So, <clears throat> so it's, it's really useless radio call. And I use this, you've both heard this before. I, I've used this in, in our rusty pilots. Anybody that's seen one of my rusty pilots uh, live has heard this story, but I was flying out, um, of Brenham Airport, which is a, a small airport with a nice little restaurant on it in the, in the hill country. And as we were flying out, I had a student in the airplane and we're flying out and uh, I hear this call. And this is, I'm not making this up. It's Phenom, uh, Brenham traffic Phenom 12345 or 10 miles out inbound on the RNAV 17. Um, any traffic in the area, known or unknown, please advise. And <laughs> I just looked at my student, which is. <laughs> How do you answer that? <laughs> I love that. I absolutely love it. Kay, now let's say you're ATC and I'm flying and you call me up and say traffic at 12 o'clock, five miles, same altitude. And I say, looking, what's your response? I'd be a little irritated. <laughs> you know, whenever I hear people say looking for traffic and sometimes it's like, they, they'll click and say looking and they're they're actually looking and they're holding on to the mic <laughs> looking for traffic and and that just ties up the frequency it, it's assumed that you're looking for traffic right and they give you a radio so it's there's only two answers traffic in sight or negative contact there's really okay. no other response oh no i got them on the fish finder and, and that's <laughs> no not good either they want you to know whether you see them with your eyes so, you, so I, I can't say i got them on the metal detector either you know, this brings up the, the concept of the pilot controller glossary. And Donnie, if you've just got a picture of that, it's a large document. It actually exists. We really are supposed to use certain terminology. And, and you don't have to go crazy trying to memorize all of it. But the point here being all these slang expressions aren't helpful. They generally take up more time on the frequency than is necessary. It's kind of like checking in with ATC and saying with you. They know you're with them. You're talking to them. You don't have to do that. And you might not think that's a big thing because you're just saying it once. But they hear it hundreds and hundreds of times a day. So we can just let that go. Just say, Cessna 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5,500 feet. They knew you were coming. The last controller told them. So, by the way, I'll throw in one more thing in this closing minute. There is an air-to-air frequency, 122.75. So if you're flying out there in golf or echo airspace and you've got a friend in another airplane or you're trying to check in on another CFI or whatever, or maybe you're you're just chatting about your plans for later this evening, don't do it on the common traffic advisory frequency. Go to 12275. And by the way, I have ferried airplanes with somebody else in trail, and that's just how we keep track of each other. We go to 12275. Speed difference is no big deal. Then we know what's going on. You hear you you hear people talk about go to one two three four five fingers. Sometimes they call them. Yep. The problem with that is that's an oceanic frequency. So yeah, it's a legitimate frequency for not us. So so one twenty two seventy five is a proper air to air frequency. Yeah. Oh, I like this. Rick Vessel said he heard this near Martin State. 
the pilot says, Martin, stake this is Cessna 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 over the bay, inbound landing, ATC. Cessna 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the bay is 100 miles long and 30 miles wide. Can you be a little more specific? <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I like that a lot. Folks, this has been fantastic. I love, love, love the participation tonight. Just terrific. All of you have been great. I, I'm so pleased to have you on tonight. Kay, do you have any parting words from Southern California that might bring a little bit of palm tree, sunshine, brilliance to our lives? Well, in terms of radio communication, be short and sweet. So that's what I'll do. I like it. Pat, I believe a couple things have come out tonight. One, you're extraordinarily knowledgeable. Two, you only fly to airports with a good restaurant. Would you <laughs> like to add anything else to this milieu of, of information that our visitors might benefit from? Well, last last week I ended the, the program by starting to read the FARs. And I, I, I would like to continue that uh, this week. On your time, buddy. On your time. <laughs> Well, I will let you know that we really are pleased to have you here tonight. It has been wonderful. Elijah G., you are more than welcome. John, Eric Pittman, Rick, it was wonderful having you here with us tonight. I hope you'll come back next time, Tuesday, May 24th, 7 o'clock Eastern, 4 o'clock Pacific. What time is it at your house, Pat? I can't do the math. Okay. Somewhere in the middle, we'll be there. And you can always watch the reruns on Facebook, the AOPA page, or on YouTube, AOPA Live. We very much appreciate you being here. And so does Donnie McKay, who's in the background making sure everything works. Y'all have a wonderful Tuesday night, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.